Achasana in Bronzeville, A Wedding in Brownsville, by Isaac Basheva Singer, 1964. The wedding had been a burden to Dr. Solomon Margolin from the very beginning. True, it was to take place on a Sunday, but Gretel had been right when she said it was the only evening in the week they could spend together. It always turned out that way. His responsibilities to the community made him give away the evenings that belonged to her. The Zionists had appointed him to a committee. He was a board member of a Jewish scholastic society. He had become co-editor of an academic Jewish quarterly. And though he often referred to himself as an agnostic and even an atheist, nevertheless, for years, he had been dragging Gretel to satyrs at Abraham Michaelis, a landsman von Sensemann. Now Abraham Michaelis was marrying off his youngest daughter, Sylvia. The minute the invitation arrived, Gretel had announced her decision. She was not going to let herself be carted off to a wedding somewhere out in the wilds of Bronzeville. If he, Solomon, wanted to go and gorge himself on all kinds of greasy food, coming home at three o'clock in the morning, that was his prerogative. Dr. Margolin admitted to himself that his wife was right. When would he get a chance to sleep? He had to be at the hospital early Monday morning. Moreover, he was on a strict, fat-free diet. A wedding like this one would be a feast of poisons. Everything, everything about such celebrations irritated him now. The anglicized Yiddish, the Yiddishized English, the ear-splitting music and unruly dances. Jewish laws and customs were completely distorted. Men who had no regard for Jewishness wore skullcaps, and the revered rabbis and cantors aped the Christian ministers. Whenever he took Gretel to a wedding or bar mitzvah, he was ashamed. Even she, born a Christian, could see that American Judaism was a mess. At least this time he would be spared the trouble of making apologies to her. During the years, he had stopped attending the functions of the Sen Siminer Society. Meanwhile, the town of Sen Simen had been destroyed. His family there had been tortured, burned, gassed. Many Sen Siminers had survived and later come to America from the camps, but most of them were younger people whom he, Solomon, had not known in the old country. Tonight, everyone would be there the Sen Siminers belonging to the bride's family and the Teresh Bullers belonging to the grooms. He knew how they would pester him, reproach him for growing aloof, drop hints that he was a snob. Well, even so, he had to go to Sylvia's wedding. He had already sent out the present. The day had dawned gray and dreary as dusk. Overnight, heavy snow had fallen. Solomon Margolin had hoped to make up for the sleep he was going to lose, but unfortunately he had waked even earlier than usual. Finally, he got up, shaved himself meticulously at the bathroom mirror, and also trimmed the gray hair at his temples. Today of all days, he looked his age. There were bags under his eyes, and his face was lined. Exhaustion showed on his features. His nose appeared longer and sharper than usual. There were deep folds at the side of his mouth. After breakfast, he stretched out on the living room sofa. From there, he could see Gretel, who was standing in the kitchen, ironing, blonde, faded, middle-aged. She had on a skimpy petticoat, and her calves were as muscular as a dancer's. Gretel had been a nurse in the Berlin hospital where he had been a member of the staff. Of her family, one brother, a Nazi, had died of typhus in a Russian prison camp. A second, who was a communist, had been shot by the Nazis. She herself had become almost Jewish in New York. She had made friends with Jewish women, joined Hadassah, learned to cook Jewish dishes. Even her sighs were Jewish. She had a plot waiting for her beside his in that part of the cemetery that the Sen Siminers had reserved for themselves. Dr. Margolin yawned, reached for the cigarette that lay in an ashtray on the coffee table beside him, 
and began to think about himself. Ostensibly, he was a success. He had an office on West End Avenue and wealthy patients. His colleagues respected him, and he was an important figure in Jewish circles in New York. <laughs> what more could a boy from Sen Simon expect? A self-taught man, the son of a poor teacher of Talmud. But secretly, Solomon Margolin had always felt that he was a failure. As a child, he had been acclaimed a prodigy, reciting long passages of the Bible and studying the Talmud and commentaries on his own. He had taught himself algebra and geometry. At 17, had, he had attempted a translation of Spinoza's ethics from Latin into Hebrew, unaware that it had been done before. Everyone, everyone predicted he would turn out to be a genius, but he had squandered his talents continually changing his field of study. And he had wasted years in learning languages and wandering from country to country. Nor had he any luck with his one great love, Rezel, the daughter of Melech, the watchmaker. Rezel had married someone else and later been shot by the Nazis. He still lay awake at night trying to solve the mysteries of the universe. He suffered from hypochondria and the fear of death haunted even his dreams. Hitler's carnage and the extinction of his family had rooted out his last hope for better days, had destroyed all his faith in humanity. Gretel came in from the kitchen. What shirt are you going to put on? Solomon regarded her quietly. She had her own share of troubles. She had suffered in silence for her two brothers, even for Hans, the Nazi. She had gone through a prolonged change of life. She had become sexually frigid. Now her face was flushed and covered with beads of sweat. He earned more than enough to pay for a maid, yet Gretel insisted on doing all the housework herself, even the laundry. Every day, she scoured the oven. She was forever polishing the windows of their apartment on the 16th floor without using a safety belt. She still suspected him of carrying on with every female patient he treated. Now, husband and wife sized each other up wryly, feeling the strangeness that comes with great familiarity. He was amazed how she had lost her looks no one feature had altered, but something in her aspect had given way. Her pride, her hopefulness, her curiosity. He blurted out, what shirt? It doesn't matter, a white shirt. You're not going to wear the tuxedo? Wait, I'll bring you a vitamin. I don't want a vitamin. But you yourself say they're good for you. Leave me alone. Well, it's your health, not mine. And slowly she walked out of the room, hesitating as if she expected him to remember something and call her back. Dr. Solomon Margolin took a last look in the mirror and left the house. He felt refreshed by the half hour nap he had had after dinner. Despite his age, he still wanted to impress people with his appearance, even the sand seminars. He was often aware that he could pass for an Anglo-Saxon. He was tall, slim, blonde, blue-eyed. His hair was thinning, had turned somewhat gray, but he managed to disguise these signs of age. He stooped a little, but in company was quick to straighten up. Years ago in Germany, he had worn a monocle, and though in New York that would have been too pretentious, his glance retained a European severity. He had his principles. He had never broken the Hippocratic Oath. With his patience, he was honorable to an extreme. Dr. Margolin's car was in the garage, not a Cadillac like that of most of his colleagues. But he decided to go by taxi. He was unfamiliar with Brooklyn and the heavy snow made driving hazardous. He waved his hand and, and at once a taxi pulled over to the curb. He was afraid the driver might refuse to go as far as Brownsville, but he flicked the meter on without a word. Dr. Margolin peered through the frosted window into the wintry Sunday night, but there was nothing to be seen. 
After a while, Dr. Margolin leaned back, shut his eyes, and retreated into his own warmth. His destination was the wedding. Wasn't the world like this taxi plunging away somewhere into the unknown toward a cosmic destination? Maybe a cosmic Brownsville, a cosmic wedding? Yes. But why did God, or whatever anyone wanted to call him, create a Hitler or a Stalin? Why did he need world wars? Why heart attacks, cancers? Dr. Margolin took out a cigarette and lit it mechanically. What had they been thinking of? Those pious uncles of his when they were digging their own graves. Was immortality possible? Was there such a thing as the soul? All the arguments for and against weren't worth a pinch of dust. The taxi turned onto the bridge across the East River, and for the first time, Dr. Margolin was able to see the sky. It sagged low, heavy, red as glowing metal. Snow was sifting down gently, bringing a winter peace to the world, just as it had in the past, 40 years ago, a thousand years ago, perhaps a million years ago. On Eastern Parkway, the taxi was jolted and screeched suddenly to a stop. Some traffic accident, apparently. The, the siren on a police car shrieked. A wailing ambulance drew nearer. Dr. Margolin closed his eyes. Another victim. Someone makes a false turn of the wheel, and all a man's plans in this world are reduced to nothing. Sometime later, the taxi started moving again. Solomon Margolin was now driving through streets he had never seen before. It was New York, but it might just as well have been Chicago or Cleveland. They passed through an industrial district with factory buildings, warehouses of coal, lumber, lumber scrap iron. Negroes stood about on the sidewalk, staring ahead, their great dark eyes full of a gloomy hopelessness. Just when Solomon Margolin was beginning to suspect that the driver, who remained stubbornly silent the whole time, had gotten lost or, or else was deliberately taking him out of his way, the taxi entered a thickly populated neighborhood. They passed a synagogue, a funeral parlor, and there, ahead, was the wedding hall, all lit up with its neon Jewish sign and the Star of David. Dr. Margolin gave the driver a dollar tip, and the man took it without uttering a word. Dr. Margolin entered the outer lobby, and immediately the comfortable intimacy of the San Simoners engulfed him. All the faces he saw were familiar, though he didn't recognize individuals. Leaving his hat and coat in the cloakroom, he put on a skull cap and entered the hall. It was filled with people and music, with tables heaped with food, a bar stacked with bottles. The musicians were playing, men were dancing with men, women with women, men with women. He saw black skull caps, white skull caps, bare heads. Guests kept arriving, pushing their way through the crowd, some still in their hats and coats, munching hors d'oeuvres, drinking schnapps. The hall resounded with stamping, screaming, laughing, clapping. Flash bulbs went off blindingly as the photographers made their rounds. Dr. Margolin knew everybody and yet knew nobody. People spoke to him, laughed, winked, waved, and he answered each one with a smile, a nod, a bow. Gradually, he threw off all his worries, all his depression. He became half drunk on the amalgam of odors, flowers, sauerkraut, garlic, perfume, mustard, and that nameless odor that only sends simoners emit. Hello, doctor. Hello, Shleima Duvid. You don't recognize me? Look, he forgot. Someone had already kissed him, a badly shaven snout, a mouth reeking of whiskey and rotten teeth. The gedengst machnecht. Take a look, it's Cecil, the son of Chaya Bele. 
Eh, Esepis, why don't you eat something, drink something? What do you want? Whiskey, brandy, cognac, scotch, with soda, with Coca-Cola? Come on, so long as you're here, you might as well enjoy yourself. And my father, he was killed. They were all killed. I'm the only one left of my family, said another person. So Rale shot together with her children. Abraham Zilberstein, they burned him in the synagogue with 20 others. A mound of charcoal was all that was left, coal and ash. Ah, l'chaim shloyme duvid. Doesn't offend you that I call you shloyme duvid. To me, you're still the same shloyme duvid, the little boy with the blonde side curls who recited a whole tractate of the Talmud by heart. <laughs> may seem like only yesterday your father may he rest in peace was beaming with pride your brother chai and your uncle oize they killed everyone everyone they took a whole people and wiped them out with german efficiency <laughs> have you seen the bride yet pretty as a picture but too much makeup imagine the grandchild of reb todorus of ratzen and her grandfather used to wear two skull caps, one in front and one in back. We were exterminated, wiped out. Even the survivors carried death in their heart. But it's a wedding. Let's be cheerful. L'chaim Shleim Adovid, have you a son or daughter to marry her? No? Well, it's better that way. What's the sense of having children if people are such murderers? It was already time for the ceremony, but someone still had not come, whether it was the rabbi or Cantor or one of the in-laws who was missing, nobody seemed able to find out. The musicians never stopped playing for an instant. The dances became faster, more abandoned, and more and more people were drawn in. The young man stamped with such force that it seemed the dance floor would break under them. Small boys romped around like goats, and little girls whirled about wildly together. There was so much commotion that Solomon Margolin could no longer grasp what was being said to him, and simply nodded yes to everything. Names were swallowed up in the tumult. He heard the same words over and over again, died, shot, burned. Margolin didn't recall drinking anything, but he felt intoxicated all the same. The foggy hall was spinning like a carousel. The floor was rocking. Standing in a corner, he contemplated the dance. Every face told its own story. They were dancing together, these people, but each one had his own philosophy, his own approach. A man grabbed Margolin, and for a while he danced in the frantic whirl. Then tearing himself loose, he stood apart. Who was that woman? He found his eye caught by her familiar form. He knew her. She beckoned to him. He stood baffled. She looked neither young nor old. Where had he known her? That narrow face, those dark eyes, that girlish smile. Her hair was arranged in the old manner with long braids wound like a wreath around her head. The grace of Sen Simon adorned her, something he, Margolin, had long since forgotten. And those eyes, he was in love with those eyes and had been all his life. He smiled at her and the woman smiled back. There were dimples in her cheeks. She too appeared surprised. Margolin, though he realized he had begun to blush like a boy, went up to her. I know you, but you are not from San Simon. Yes, from San Simon. He had heard that voice long ago. He had been in love with that voice. From San Simon? Who are you then? Her lips tremble. You've forgotten me already? It's a long time since I left San Simon. You used to visit my father. Who was your father? Melech the watchmaker. Dr. Margolin shivered. If I'm not out of my mind, then I'm seeing things. Well, why do you say that? 
because Rezel is dead. I am Rezel. You are Rezel? Here? Oh my God. If that's true, then anything is possible. When did you come to New York? Some time ago. From where? From over there. But everyone told me that you were dead, that you were all dead. My father, my mother, my brother, Herschel. But you were married. I was. If that's true, then anything is possible, repeated Dr. Margolin, still shaken by the incredible happening. Someone must have purposely deceived him. But why? He was aware there was a mistake somewhere, but could not determine where. Why didn't you let me know? After all, he fell silent. She too was silent for a moment. I lost everything, she said, but I still had some pride left. Oh, come with me somewhere, quieter, anywhere. This is the happiest day of my life. Oh, but it's night. Well, then the happiest night, almost as if the Messiah had come, as if the dead had come to life. Where do you want to go? All right, let's go. Margolin took her arm and felt at once the thrill long forgotten of youthful desire. He steered her away from the other guests, afraid that he might lose her in the crowd or that someone would break in and spoil his happiness. Everything had returned on the instant, the embarrassment, the agitation, the joy. He wanted to take her away, to hide somewhere alone with her. Leaving the reception hall, they went upstairs to the chapel where the wedding ceremony was to take place. The door was standing open inside. On a raised platform stood the permanent wedding canopy. A bottle of wine and a silver goblet were placed in readiness for the ceremony. The chapel, with its empty pews and only one glimmering light, was full of shadows. The music so blaring below sounded soft and distant up here. Both of them hesitated at the threshold. Margolin pointed to the wedding canopy. We could have stood there. Yes. Tell me about yourself. Where are you now? What are you doing? It is not easy to tell. Are you alone? Are you attached? Attached? No. Would you have never let me hear from you, he asked. She didn't answer. Gazing at her, he knew his love had returned with full force. Already he was trembling at the thought that they might soon have to part. The excitement and expectancy of youth filled him. He wanted to take her in his arms and kiss her, but at any moment someone might come in. He stood beside her, ashamed that he had married someone else, that he had not personally confirmed the reports of her death. How could I have suppressed all this love? How could I have accepted the world without her? And what will happen now with Gretel? Ah, I'll give her everything, my last cent. He looked around toward the stairway to see if any of the guests had started to come up. The thought came to him that by Jewish law, he was not married, for he and Gretel had only had a civil ceremony. He looked at Razel. According to Jewish law, I am a single man. Is that so? Yes, according to Jewish law. I could lead you up there and marry you. She seemed to be considering the import of his words. Yes, I realize. According to Jewish law, he went on, I don't even need a ring. One can get married with a penny. Do you have a penny? He put his hand to his breast pocket, but his wallet was gone. He started searching in his other pockets. Have I been robbed? He wondered. But how? I, I, I was sitting in the taxi the whole time. Could, could someone have robbed me here at the wedding? 
He was not so much disturbed as surprised. He said falteringly, strange, but I don't have any money. Ah, oh, we'll get along without it. But how am I going to get home? Why go home? She said, countering with a question. She smiled with that familiar smile of hers that was so full of mystery. He took her by the wrist and gazed at her. Suddenly it occurred to him that this could not be his Razel. She was too young. Oh, probably it was her daughter who was playing along with him, mocking him, for God's sake. I'm completely confused, he thought. He stood bewildered, trying to untangle the years. He couldn't tell her age from her features. Her eyes were deep, dark, and melancholy. She, she also appeared confused as if she too sensed some discrepancy. The whole thing is a mistake, Margolin told himself. But, 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 but where exactly was the mistake? And, and what had happened to the wallet? Could he have left it in the taxi after paying the driver? He tried to remember how much cash he had had in it, but was unable to. I must have had too much to drink. These people have made me drunk, dead drunk. For a long time, he stood silent, lost in some dreamless state, more profound than a narcotic trance. Suddenly, he remembered the traffic collision he had witnessed on Eastern Parkway. An eerie suspicion came over him. Perhaps he had been more than a witness, perhaps. He himself had been the victim of that accident. He began to examine himself as though he were one of his own patients. He could find no trace of pulse or breathing. It can't be, can't be, he murmured. Can one die without knowing it? And what will Gretel do? He blurted out. You are not the same Razel. No? Then who am I? Unless we're both dead. What do you mean? They shot Razel. Shot her? Who told you that? She seemed both frightened and confused. She lowered her head like someone receiving the shock of bad news. Apparently, Razel didn't realize her own condition. He had heard of such a stage. What was it called? hovering in the world of twilight. But death couldn't be that simple. This kind of survival would be less than oblivion. He leaned over and whispered in her ear, what's the difference as long as we're together? I've been waiting for that all these years. Where have you been? She didn't answer, and he didn't ask again. He looked around. The empty hall was full, all the seats taken. A ceremonious hush fell over the audience. The music played softly. The cantor intoned the benedictions. With measured steps, Abraham Machelis led his daughter down the aisle.